What's up, guys? It's Derek Kirby. It is a new day and another shot at the title. I'm back again with my friend Any and Duca. If you've been around the channel a while, you probably know him. But today we're going to be taking a look at the 2021-2022 Dallas Mavericks and giving you our predictions for how the team will finish in terms of its record, what the stat lines might look like for Luka and KP, how many games is KP going to play, and some breakout talent as well. What's up, guys? It's Eddie Duca coming at you live from his mother's basement. Just kidding. It's my apartment room. But here talking about Mavs basketball. The year's 2022. We've got some predictions for you. So the first order of business is we're going to predict the Mavs win-loss record and playoff seating. Now, last year, of course, they were the fifth seed. I always forget how many games they won. Um, however, they were good enough to win the sixth seed. I do remember them ending the year after the All-Star break on a 55-game uh, pace. So I do think they are capable of uh, winning 50-plus games this year. Um, seeding, I believe, anywhere from and, – and with the Mavericks in the West – the West being as wide open as it is, um, you know, I do see the Mavs scratching top four at the lowest five. Um, so if I had to make a prediction under my head, I would say Mavs would be the fourth seed. Um, anywhere from, let's say, 53 to 55 wins. Last year's Mavericks team, say what you will about its frustrating stretches how the season ended despite having a almost 3-0 lead on the Clippers in the first round and then blowing a 3-2 lead as well losing all three games at the American Airlines Center despite being the only team in the NBA really able to host a full capacity event all of that is very true but it's also worth noting this team due to health and safety protocols was devastated in the year early on had a stretch of about 18 games where they won something like four or five games. It, just utter brutality. And yet they climbed all the way out of that hole into the five seed heading into the playoffs. That's not nothing. If you take out the external factors, which, yes, they still exist this year, but they're not as strenuous, hopefully, to a team's prospects. So, yeah, if you look at how they performed after all of that last year, early on, they were very good. And for that reason, I'm willing to bet this is probably a team that's going to range around 50 wins again. I've seen predict predictions, projections, predictions as high as 55 wins. I'm going to say probably more in the 49 to 50 range. In fact, I'll say 49 and 33 is my prediction for this team's record. I do think that'll probably lock up the five seed again. Luca and KP stat line. All right. Luca. Is this the year Luca Doncic averages a triple double in a year? That would be pretty awesome. Um, we've seen guys like Russell Westbrook do it multiple times. Um, is this the year Luca does it? I'm not quite sure, but he does have a pretty stout stat line. Um, in my prediction, I predict anywhere from 29 points, um, eight assists, nine rebounds, somewhere we're in that ballpark, uh, flirting with the triple double. Um, I don't see him getting that because I am, when I watch the maps play, especially under Jason Kidd, I do see a lot more ball movement. I do see, um, him, Luca playing off ball a little bit more than what we saw last year. He's going to have the ball a lot in his hands, um, but we are moving the ball a lot more than uh, what we did, what we saw last year, at least from the four games we saw in preseason. Now, regular season, it can be completely different. Who knows? We don't know. I, we have a new coach we haven't had in, what, since 2008? Now, I mentioned earlier, Luca is probably going to be in the thick of that MVP consideration. He really was early on last year before the health and safety protocols just absolutely eviscerated the team's prospects. And it didn't really catch on at a national level where he elevated the team back to by the end of the year. 
he doesn't care about MVPs as much. He cares more about team success. I appreciate that. But I still think he's probably going to take another step forward. And the main reason I think Luka Doncic takes another step forward here is primarily because last year he came into the season not in the best shape. Now, I'm not saying he was Zion Williamson coming in in 2021 media days or anything like that. I am, however, saying he was not in optimal shape, and it showed. It took him about a month into the season to really round into form, to shed a little bit of that excess weight, to play his way into shape, and for his three-point percentage to go from just utter basement-level shooting to the point where Ben Simmons had a better three-point percentage than him like two or three weeks into the season to really what he ended up posting overall, which was a strong year. Like, it really was a strong year. His best numbers of his career, more than 27 points per game, is what he put forth. But in that first month, he was averaging 26.1 points, 10.1 boards, and 9.2 assists. There were some high marks, for sure. Starting out with a 32-8-5, and five. hey, that's great. But you also had a 12-5-2. and two. You had... A, a 20-10-10 is a pretty remarkable stat line, but for Luka, that comes across by his standards as pedestrian. You also had a 15-7-9, and nine, a 13-12-12. 12 and 12. He just was up and down, and a lot of that was that his shot wasn't falling, particularly the outside shot. Now, he ended up working his way into a, a career-high 35% from three, and that's great. Free throws remain a little bit of a problem. But I think the biggest thing that will work for him for another step forward this year He's coming in because of having played with Slovenia in the Olympics. He's coming into this season in the best shape he's entered any season of his career. I would argue as a rookie, while he had played uh, through EuroLeague and all of that, I think in that case, it was actually a little bit too much. It was a little excessive, and they were just trying to get him rest before the season started. And then you had the opposite effect the next couple of years. So now I think he's coming in probably with about the right level of conditioning versus rest. And that's going to be big. He's not going to have to suffer through the first half or first half of the initial month or two of the season and then have to kind of dig his way out of that. He posted 27.7 points per game last year. I think he probably takes a step forward. I think you're looking at something like a 28.6 points per game for Luca, 8.9 rebounds and 9.4 assists. Is it possible he averages even a triple-double, which would pretty significantly exceed what I have here? Yes, I think it's possible that he could do that, but I don't think he's going to chase it in the way that some other guys have chased it in the past. So for him, I think you're probably looking at something close to it, teasing it, but they're going to try and keep his usage measured where they can. Now, KP stat line. Um, KP averaged somewhere around 20 points, uh, last year on a down year, um, with these four games in preseason, we have seen him vastly improved. Um, he did go through his first healthy off season, um, with the Mavs. So, um, if I were to predict his stat line, um, I'm predicting somewhere around 21, 22 points a game. Can, is that good enough to get? KP an all-star bid who knows the the the, to be an all-star this year is harder than harder than ever in in recent history I know uh guys like Carl Anthony Towns averaging 25 points a game uh didn't make it um so I mean because he was probably on a losing team but you know it used to be if you're averaging 25 points a game you're a perennial all-star making it year after year but now it's not even good enough because it's the the skill base in the league is so big. I know KP, I think he, he was voted in uh, his last, the year he got hurt playing for the New York Knicks. I think he was averaging around 22 points a game. Uh, can he do that? I, I, do, I do see that. If he's playing at the current pace, he's playing at right now. Um, you know, if everything lines up, if he has a healthy year, I do see him able to do that with the Mavs. Um, this year so here's to hoping rebounds eight or nine rebounds a game let's hope that he you know he's put in work he was in the gym we saw multiple pictures of him on Instagram bulking up getting ready for the season ready to take on the big bodies down low 
hopefully that would translate to more rebounds because that is something that the Mavericks year by year are slowly are sorely lacking in. So hopefully that improves. With his personal stat line, I think last year with him having a 20 and 10 season, if you looked at his shooting splits, they were either on par with his better years in New York or career highs even. He shot 37.5% from three last year. Now, we all remember him being a corner decoy in the playoffs against the Clippers and not even really being particularly effective in shooting those for the most part, although he did have a really big three. I think it was in game two uh, that kind of was the dagger for that game when Dallas took a 2-0 lead. But even still, I think you have to be a little bit cautious in that. I think his shooting splits will probably be fairly in line with what we saw last year. The difference is, I think the opportunities he's getting are going to be, they're going to look different. And so I think he will step forward in terms of his scoring. Jason Kidd has harped away on making KP as much like his all-star form in New York as possible, trying to get the most you can out of him and not just say, hey, I'm going to pack you into this box and it's your job to figure out how to fill that role because what you are is not necessarily what I think is best for us. That was kind of the case last year. So with that being the case, I think you're probably looking at something like 24 and a half points per game at a KP. Again, that would be his best year in Dallas. That would be more in line with what I anticipated him coming to Dallas with. I think his first year I projected about 26 points. I've scaled that back a little bit. Because at the time, to be fair, and I'm going to acknowledge my own fail here, I thought he was going to be the leading scorer of the team with Luka more in a distributor role, averaging about 24, 25 points, and KP just a tick above that. That has since proven to not be the case. So I'm going to say KP averaging 24 to 24 and a half points is pretty strong. Pretty strong for what I think they'll get from him. I think he averages a career high in rebounds this year at 96 He averaged, I think, 8.9 roughly last year. And I think he's going to have the second best year of his career with regard to blocks per game at 2.2. He did have a 2.4. He might have had a 2.3 with Dallas. But I think he's going to be over two blocks a game. And that's going to kind of restore some of that defensive presence that was really good for him when he first started playing for the Mavericks and why even when his offensive game was lacking, you still looked at what he could bring defensively and you're like, yeah, but that's great. Like that really makes us dangerous. And once that offensive game does round into shape, look out. You got there eventually. The problem was you weren't able to stay there very long. KP's game played. Uh, I, I can see KP probably missing around. 20, maybe 25 games. I'm not the quickest at math, um, but anywhere from 62, maybe 57 games played. That's my prediction for that. I think we need to take a look at the greatest ability, and that's availability. KP last year played in 43 games in a 72-game season. That's just over half. Not not the strongest. I say it's just over half. It's really more like 60%. I'm being a little bit harsh in that criticism. But it's still not where you want your second best player to be. You want him available more often. I think there were times where he did have legitimate injuries that needed to be tended to. Times he needed rest, like when he was having back spasms over the course of a week or so. Fine. Valid. No issues. I also think there were times where Carlisle specifically said, hey... I want you to get some rest or you've been kind of a defensive liability for us lately, given the unfair circumstance of which you came from last off season into this season with. So we're going to hope that getting you some more rest mitigates that a little bit instead of continuing to throw you out there while you're already wearing down from not really getting a fair shake as far as coming in in condition and healthy. So that's what I would look at there. I think KP, you're always going to have, some some games missed he had his rookie year i want to say where he played more than 70 games i don't see that happening i really think you're going to have to account for about a quarter of the season maybe 70 74 75 percent of the season you'll have him but you're talking about a quarter of the season roughly where he will not be available whether it's for legitimate injury whether it's for rest 
and you're just going to have to deal with that. But if he is there for three-fourths of the season and he's effective for most of that three-fourths, I think you'll have what you need. I think you have enough just with Luka being Luka and with the supporting cast around him that you can work through it. Last year, for instance, they had to play a lot without KP, and it really didn't miss too many beats as the season wore on. They got used to playing without him, and so it was like, hey, if we got him, great. If we don't, all right, man, we've been doing this all year anyway, and we've found how to be successful even in his absence. So with that being the case, I think you're going to get something about if you take, if you're saying, if you're saying 75% of the games played, that's basically 60 games, just a hair over 60 games, I think, that you're talking about him playing in the season. And uh, for some people, that might be too low. They might look at that as still disappointing. I'm going to say if you get 60 games out of KP and he is a beast for you in 53 to 55 of those, being a legitimate number two option, you got what you need. And anything more is a gift. Uh, Moses Brown minutes per game. So Moses Brown, the seven two gazelle that we that we traded for uh, from the Boston Celtics, he averaged about ten point two minutes a game this uh, preseason. Uh, seven points and four rebounds. Look, the guy is raw. Um, He's athletic. He's seven two. I do see him if paired with the right people like Luca. Luca can probably make him look a lot better than what he is. Um, he is someone that I'm excited for because he is a tremendous rebounder. I know the four rebounds a game in the preseason is not really impressive, but he is someone that, if given minutes, he is he is someone that's gotten twenty points, twenty rebounds in the game before. Now, no matter who you are, um, that is quite impressive in any sense. I don't care if you're tanking or if you're contending for a championship getting 20 rebounds in a game is impressive and that is something that he can't do now under the tutelage of Tyson Chandler and he was a very uh good center for the Mavericks perhaps the best the Mavericks have ever had um I do if he if I'm guessing Moses Brown minutes per game um it will probably be somewhere around the same 10 minutes per game spot minutes. Um, I do hope he improves. Um, can I predict that? I'm not quite confident enough to say, Hey, Moses Brown is going to be a, a staple in the rotation um, because he was so in that, you know, barely got any playing time in the preseason. Um, so, I mean, here's the hope this, uh, I think he's a weapon that we could possibly use, utilize, um, you know, if we have to go big, like we did against, uh, the Clippers last year in the preseason, um, that is someone I would like to see more than honestly, Boban, um, Boban. Yes. He has his uses. Yes. He's very efficient with the time he's on the court. However, Boban is very slow on the court. He is virtually, uh, on defense or we're, we're pretty much playing four on five, uh, with Boban on the floor. Um, he's not a shot blocker. He's a good rebound because he's seven four and probably one of the heaviest guys in the league. Um, but if we can substitute Boban for a guy like uh, Moses Brown, who's a little bit more quicker on his feet, um, who's a little bit more of a threat to alter shots and and, and block shots, I, I I do see some use for him if it's something that we have to do. So I'm somewhere around 10, 10 minutes a game, 10, 11, 12 um, is what I'm predicting from Moses Brown. I've said Moses Brown is an intriguing prospect. We've seen the 2020 games he's had. We've seen the highs and lows of it. I've written about him multiple times. I've done a couple videos on him. I do think he's an intriguing prospect, but I also want to temper expectations because you do have some people legitimately saying right now he should be your starting center. I'm sorry, but no, no, he doesn't have the consistency. I love that Tyson's mentoring him. I think there can be a role he carves out for himself here in Dallas, but I don't look at him right now and say, that's my starting center. Before, everyone got up in a tizzy when Jason Kidd said Dwight Powell was going to be the starting center for the Mavericks, but it's worth noting, Kidd went to Luka, KP, and Tim Hardaway Jr. and asked them who they want starting at the five. All three of them, without hesitation, said Dwight Powell. That tells you something. All of them 
want and believe that. So KP's getting what he wants playing at the four. And Luca likes the lob threat he's got with Powell. Hardaway also voicing support for that. So that's that's going to be that. <laughs> Your starting center is Powell. You're not going to have that role for Moses Brown. I think Moses Brown is probably going to be relatively reserved. I hope he plays into the long-term future for the Mavericks. But if he can carve out maybe 11 to 12 minutes per game, I think you're going to get a good impact role player for you. A guy who can come in and change things up. He can uh, he can bother the basket a little bit. He's got better mobility, certainly, than Boban. And yeah, it's another giant you have on the team now. You've got a 7-2, a 7-3, and a 7-4, basically. Or maybe Boban's also 7-3, but it, it's ridiculous, the, the height you have in this lineup, or in this roster, rather. But I think you get enough out of Moses Brown in condensed, and that's an average, right? Like, you're going to have nights where you do play him closer to 20 minutes per game, and he might have a big impact for you in that time. But I don't think it's a guy you can roll out there night after night and play 20, 25, 30 minutes a game. I just don't see that happening. I think maybe he can grow towards that. But for now, I'm going to keep it in the low, low figures here and say on average, he's probably something like 11, 12 minutes a night. Offensive and defensive rating. Now, Derek is normally the guy who has all the information about where Mavericks are ranked um, offensively, defensively. Um, I'm not that guy. I'm really not. But if I was to if I was to guess their offensive rating, if I were to look it up really quick, so their offensive rating they were uh, eighth last year. Do I see that getting better with the with the additions that we made this pre uh, this off season? I do see that possibly getting better. Um, and with KP coming back more healthy, I do see them bumping that up. Maybe I can see that even being fifth. Um, now, talent wise with the, with the loss of Josh Richardson, I know every, he, he kind of left a sour taste on everyone's mouth at the end of the season. Talent wise, he was a talented player. Like he was defense. He can hit the mid range shot. Um, and he could, you can play, make a little bit. So off, um, talent wise, we gotten worse, but in terms of fit, in my estimation, I think we've gotten better. Uh, so we've added a plethora of, uh, well, a plethora, uh, some really good three point shooters and, Sterling Brown and, and Reggie Bullock. Um, and I think that translates to better efficiency on our offensive side, on offensive side of the ball. And so if we ranked eighth place um, last year, I can see that moving up anywhere uh, closer to where we were two years ago when we had Seth Curry, probably, you know, fifth, maybe sixth. Um, now, defensively, now this is where we're really talking about the impact of our n- n- new acquisitions. Um, we ranked 19th. We were tied for 19th last year, which is not good. That's below average. We want to push that closer, uh, closer to average and above average um, if we can. Now, you know, with Jason Kidd, um, we'll, we'll coach Kidd, Emphasizing defense, we saw that a lot with with our with our, in our acquisitions um, through the off season. And like I said, Sterling Brown, Reggie Bullock, uh, Frank Nilakina, and Moses Brown. Uh, those are guys that are are in place that are supposed to help improve our defense. And I can see that happening now. Nineteen or uh, can I, can we get that closer to fifteen fourteen? Um, that will be somewhere I predict. We looked really, uh, we looked very active on defense in the preseason. Uh, we were able to um, get a lot of steals, a lot of blocks, make a lot of plays that it was um, encouraging to see. Um, can we keep that up in the season? That's that's the real question. I predict yes. 
Now we get into the offensive and defensive ratings for the Mavericks. Last year, the offense was still pretty good. It took a long time for them to get there, but they were a top 10 offense in terms of their rating. I think they were eighth last year. I actually think they're going to take a little bit of a step forward this year by virtue of me saying KP is going to be his best season as a Maverick. If you get the best year of KP as a Maverick, and I think Hardaway is also going to be primed, and this is a little bit of foreshadowing, I think you're looking in that case at, uh, at a step forward and you move up to seventh, just a, just a little bit, seventh in offensive rating. And that's also in part because of what I see other teams in the West having done some of the adjustments they've made. It's not just a flat landscape outside of Dallas. I'm like, oh, where did Dallas get better? You have to look at it in the hole. They might have gotten a lot better potentially, but if the rest of the landscape shifted in such a way, it's not going to reflect just purely looking at those numbers you know, one year apart. A change I think is going to be noteworthy is defense. The Mavericks defensively were not very good last year. They rated out in 19th in defensive rating. I think they're going to be better. I think, and this is another one that you look at it on paper, you might say like, well, that's still like the middle of the road. Why is that significant? The gap become sizable once you hit the bottom half of the league in terms of defensive rating. You start going to jumps. You start having jumps where you're, instead of talking about 110, 111 defensive efficiency and all that, you're looking instead at 115, 116. It, the gap widens. They were 19th in defensive uh, rating last year. I think they're going to take a, a good step forward this year. Again, appending a lot of that to KP being better on the defensive end. I think if your anchor is right, you're going to be in a good situation. And I do think Moses Brown will also be able to block a couple shots for you as well, even if it's in limited minutes. So I think if your rim protection's good, and I expect to get more out of Bullock than we got out of Josh Richardson last year defensively as well, I think they will take a step forward, and I have them at 16th in defensive rating. Again, that's the middle of the road of the league, but if you have a top 10 offense and a defense hovering near the middle, then you're not too far outside of that top 10 in both categories, which contenders really need to be in. So, yeah, that's something to keep an eye on. Maybe they start gelling later in the year and they're playing better come playoff time than the overall season figures would, you know, would reference but or indicate. But that's where I got them. Look, I think, Tim, um, getting the contract he got, and not even have to worry about free agency, anything like that. He is locked in. He is secure for another, I don't know, how long did he sign? Four years. Um, I don't know, how long did he sign? Four years. I don't know, how long did he sign? Four years. I don't know, how long did he sign? Four years. And that can do a lot to a player's confidence in and when we're talking about shooting the three that has a lot to do with a player's confidence. So I think um, if I'm take if I'm guessing over or under 39.5, I'm definitely taking the over. If I'm a betting man, I'm definitely taking the over on Tim Hardaway shooting over 39.5% from three. Tim Hardaway Jr., had the best three-point shooting year of his career last year. Is he going to be over or under last year's 39.5% from three? He got his money. Is he going to step up and continue getting better with Luka Doncic? I'm going to say yes. I'm taking the over. I think Tim Hardaway Jr. for the first time in his career will be a 40% plus three-point shooter. I will be curious to see how much higher he'll go. But we know last year he posted, again, the best efficiency-wise three-point sh uh, shooting year of his career, and that was without KP being KP. Yeah, he was 20 and 10, but he wasn't really KP as we knew him offensively the year before prior to the meniscus. And when I say the year before, I'm talking literally about once KP got dialed in from January and then until the meniscus in the bubble. And that two-and-a-half-month stretch there where everything was working for the Mavericks – Hardaway could just feast on anything because the gravity of Luca and KP just left him on an island there, standing at the perimeter, waiting for just spoon-fed three-point looks. 
and he's going to eat you alive if you give him those looks. Also, I think the Mavericks, in being less about Rockets ball, less about just hoisting a million threes this year and operating more in the mid-range game, I do think that will suit him a little bit better because you saw sometimes last year uh, Hardaway would be struggling a little bit with his outside shot, but those were really the only looks he was getting a lot of the times. Unless he was getting out in transition, he wasn't getting a lot of opportunities in the mid-range or getting all the way to the cup. And so I think kind of taking that cap off of the mid-range a little bit for Dallas will work better for even if he is in struggle mode a little bit, he'll be able to work his way out of it by being more trusting in his full repertoire. Now, Frank Nilakina's points per game. Um, and so Frankie, oh, he doesn't want to be called that. So if I'm going to guess Frank Nilakina's points per game, I'll probably guess somewhere around Mm. does he crack the rotation that's the question if he cracks the rotation who is he playing with is he playing with guys where he will have to he will have to i guess be contribute on offense more or be uh or is he playing with you know some guys like luca and and like kp where he can kind of uh, be the fourth or fifth option on our on the floor. And who is he playing as? That's the main question. Who is he playing with? That's the main question for me. If I'm looking at Frank, um, I'm probably guessing, uh, let's say, man, let's say five points a game. Um, that's not terrible in terms of what his, what, what he has produced in the past, but we all know Frank's value comes from his defense and his long arms. And we did see a lot of that in the, in the preseason. Um, and he's, he's someone that I'm really excited about. He's someone that can, he could perhaps contribute. Um, he is that Josh Richardson, DeLon Wright type player, but the good thing is he's, <laughs> he's on our third string. So where, where those guys pretty much ended up, uh, being at the end of their tenure as Mavs. So he's starting a year like that. Can he move up in the rotation uh, and become a solid contributor on a consistent basis? Um, if he can, uh, I can see him getting up to maybe six, seven points a game. Next, I'm going to go with Frank Nilakina. What are his points per game? Now, this bar is very low. You must understand that. We're talking about a guy who has never averaged six points per game in his career. It's been very low. I think even though his role is going to be a little bit up in the air and he'll be used more as an energy and defense guy early on, I do think he does set a new career high for points per game. I have him at 6.7 points per game this year. I think a lot of what he's going to bring to the table will suit him well in this offense and he'll be able to carve out a nice little niche as a, as a different flavor off the bench for them and a guy that can make some good plays. And, you know, again, when your bar is that low, it's kind of hard to, to undersell it. My breakout player. Now, when discussing breakout player, how I describe a breakout player is someone who, who contributes consistently higher than we initially thought he was going to do at the beginning of the season. And if I was to come up with one player in our, on our roster that can fit that description for me, I'm not sure where Derek, what he has um, as his breakout player and how he describes that breakout player. Cause a breakout player can be, you know, uh, Jalen Brunson averaging 17, 18 points a game. That would be pretty cool as a breakout player coming off the bench. I'll probably put him somewhere in in the midst of the people in, uh, who are in conversation for six man of the year. Um, if I was to guess and predict a breakout player, I would say that breakout player of the for our team will be Sterling Brown. Here's why: Sterling Brown definitely fits everything that the Mavs need in terms of he's a good defender, he's a good shooter. And what we saw in the preseason 
He's he can actually handle the ball a little bit. Um, is he a playmaker? Not necessarily, but he is someone that he can attack. He's we saw some cutting um, from him. So that's someone I think he will mesh well with the players that we have, either with Luca or with Jalen Brunson if he's running with the second, primarily with the second team. Uh, so if I'm to guess. Finally, who is the breakout player for me for the Mavericks this year? I'm going to go Jalen Brunson. Why Jalen Brunson? Because Jalen Brunson still hasn't gotten paid. Say what you will, the, the extensions for the 2018 draft class are due. Brunson has not gotten paid. And I think, you know, for, for a guy whose vibes always seem to be immaculate, I think he's aware of that, and I think his value to Dallas is very strong as well. Now, is he due the estimated 3 for 57 extension that I saw John Hollinger post? Mm, I don't know about that. Yeah, he was borderline unplayable in the playoffs last year, but the Clippers are a really tough matchup for most anybody. That's not always going to be the case. And for the role he brings to the team, he is the second best creator on this roster right now. So... You do have to consider his his viability to this team and his importance to this team. The fact he hasn't been paid yet yet today, as I'm recording this, I just saw a notification come through. Uh, Josh Green is getting an extension. Make of that what you will. If you're extending Green, granted the money's not obviously the same, but if you're extending Green, surely, surely you're going to look to to pay Brunson something fair. And I think Brunson's going to come out with a chip on his shoulder that's going to suit him very well. I think he's going to take another step forward this year and be a real viable candidate in the six-man conversation. So those are our predictions for the 2021-2022 Mavericks season. Let me know in the comments. What do you have? What do you think the Mavericks record is going to be? How many games do you think KP plays? Who's your breakout player? Some other such item that I have discussed here today. Leave a like, drop a comment, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect, and until next time, guys, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace!